Okay, um, it's 7.20, this is, this is gonna be our opportunity for our second budget workshop. So this is technically not part of the regular meeting, so we don't have to call that back in order until after the workshop. Um, at this time, I will turn, turn it over to Mr. Steve Schleicher, who will go through our, our budget. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, we'll just pause for one second uh, while Eric brings up the presentation, and we'll be on. As, as I said, when we finished up our last budget workshop, uh, the numbers that we will see tonight are, are what we call our all-in budget. Um, with everyone's wish list, everything that we know so far to date, um, so these numbers, again, will be moving and hopefully becoming smaller. As, uh, so don't, don't panic when you see some of the numbers. Um, and we'll work through them, and I'll describe them as we move along. So, here we go. Uh, these are some of the numbers that we now have as a tax-based growth factor, as you can see, basically 1%. Our allowable growth factor uh, as well uh, has also came in about 1.8%, as you see uh, the two blue line items there, uh, leaving us uh, basically down on the bottom of the maximum allowable tax levy of 114640000 with our exemption. <coughs> and as you can see, the exemptions run approximately $4.3 to $4.4 million uh, from this fiscal year in the next fiscal year. Uh, leaving us with our 2% tax cap here in Suffern actually being 2.8% or uh, allowable, uh, allowing us to raise about $3.2 million in total. Um, and some anticipated expenditures here, again right now these numbers uh, will be shifting, there's no doubt about it. Um, some salaries here right now you see uh, going up 3.25% with everything that we have. Uh, thus far, we'll talk a little bit about what we're looking at, some staffing modifications here. Looking at a custodian for a Sunday schedule, because our high school right now, we are paying quite a bit of overtime uh, for someone to be there during events on Sundays. Uh, so some math was done, and, and it looks like it's very close to actually be less expensive to hire somebody to have them on there um, on a full-time basis on that Sunday schedule movement. Uh, maintenance mechanic, both at the high school and the middle school, uh, having some trouble there keeping up. Uh, they could certainly use one of those that, again, on the wish list. Um, the Board of Education uh, prior has talked about bringing public relations in-house and having someone five days a week. Uh, we have someone three days a week right now. Uh, so what we would do is, uh, is hire that public relations person in-house and remove them from our BOCI staff currently. Um, and we also have here on the wish list uh, students, two student assistant uh, counselors as well. Traditional salary benefits of about $471,000 right now. Uh, you'll notice the last bullet again, we're looking uh, still at retirements are not included in these numbers, so I want to point that out. Uh, right now, I believe we have three retirements only that are cut in stone that we know about in writing, but we expect a few more possibly. Uh, and some other modifications uh, for FTEs because obviously we're also looking uh, very closely at enrollment numbers um, and what we're going to be doing uh, pro programmatically with that. Program-wise, I'm building, sorry, uh, for our curriculum for next year. Don't we get BOCES money back for using the public relations from through BOCES? We, we do get, uh, there's a cap uh, on that. Uh, right now, the cap, I believe, is now $35,000 uh, for that because it is a uh, it is a coaster situation and we actually have that individual. Um, the problem, I believe, that we're trying to address is, is that person is here three days a week and because of a coaster, we cannot purchase any more time from BOSIS. Three days a week is all we're ever going to be able to get. Right, but, but the cost of hiring the person would be salary plus about 50% between you're taxes absolutely, you're and, absolutely correct. and retirement and all of that, health insurance. You are correct. You are correct. That's why I said these numbers are not cut in stone. It's something that the board will be discussing. We will meet again, obviously. Uh, uh, and uh, the administration will meet again as well, um, you know, to discuss what your thoughts are, and, and thank you very much for pointing that. 
And to other anticipated expenditures, obviously the benefits are also driven by what you just saw with that extra 471,000 and, and obviously other increases, which you'll see uh, momentarily. Uh, increases in health insurance right now, we're projecting uh, an increase of about 4% currently. Uh, we're hoping for a little less than that. Uh, actually, health insurance or, uh, increases across the state have actually been an all-time low. Uh, so we're, we're planning for the worst right now of about 4% from what we see. Uh, increase in teacher's retirement rate right now um, from 8.86, we're using 10.25. The retirement system um, is projecting somewhere around 9.75 right now. Um, or yeah, 9.76 I believe is the number. Uh, I added about, I asked to add about 550 uh, basis points to that or, or about a half a percent. If you watch what's going on with the stock market right now and investments for the coronavirus and its effects, I have a feeling it's going to be closer to that number than the 9.7 that they're actually talking about and, and telling us to use for projections. So again, planning for the worst right now. And obviously increases in FICA and Medicare and the increases in salaries as you had pointed out. Uh, teacher retirement here, you can see it visually. Again, this is, this is the history of the teacher's retirement system as, as it ebbs and flows with their, uh, with their investments and the number of retirees, obviously, they have to pay for. Same thing with the employees' uh, retirement system rates. Uh, again, they're, they're estimated around 14.6% 14 for next year, uh, around 14 and a half. We, I think we bumped a little bit in onto that. Um, so that's what we're gonna project for next year, current in the retirement system for the employees. Uh, health insurance, you can see uh, here, as, as we go across here, is again, a visual of, of what we've been paying. Uh, and I apologize for this graph because it actually leans forward and it looks like everything is under $16 million instead of over $16 million on that top top right row. So I, will be, I, I can't stand that. I'm, I'm too angled for that, so I'm going to fix that so it, so, it looks, so it looks proper in my eyes. But the numbers are correct at the top of every one of those silos um, that you see. Uh, so we're not doing too bad with the health insurance currently. Uh, other anticipated, obviously, special education here. Uh, going up about 3%, and what we're looking at here is uh, out-of-district placements uh, is basically is what's going to drive the special education costs uh, for next year, uh, as, as Lisa and I had discussed earlier. Uh, debt service, you'll notice, is actually going down, uh, and in a second you will see, you will see the graph of that, uh, again, which reminds us of the graph that you saw uh, actually a few times now, uh, just reminding you of of from 2018-19 and how it will play out all the way through the end of the current debt service. This does not include any new debt service on here. Um, so I don't want you to get confused when we, when we start to see a few other, a few other numbers uh, coming across for state aid. Anticipated expenditures here for transportation uh, up almost 7.73% 7, 7 or 7.4%. Uh, basically, uh, increase in number of buses and, and vans um, obviously, you got three out of out of district placements and other district placements that are moving and shifting. But the biggest increase is the not non public schools that you're seeing. Uh, we're estimating another about 250 uh, children. Uh, we we just uh, had another uh, school um, sign up with us just in the last week. Another private uh, school. So they're growing, and uh, and this population is growing. Uh, I'd like to say it isn't growing exponentially, but it is. Over the last few years, it's grown about 250 kids a year. So it's, it's grown pretty quickly. Uh, buildings and grounds, uh, you'll notice uh, here, although it, it is a big number, we are using some reserves uh, to, to offset this. We'll go into that as you saw in previous slides. Increase in security for eating security at the middle school. Um, and the high school additional, additional security at elementary events. Um, what, what, I, what I learned by going to some of our business official meetings here locally um, is we are one of the few schools, uh, believe it or not, that provides that additional security um, for evening events and uh, extracurricular activities and things like that. Uh, most schools you'll find that after the regular school day, um, they're not as secure as maybe we'd all like them to be um, for, for events. Um, and we are one of the, one of the better ones. I, I'd like to say we're, we're at the top of that, which is nice. Uh, our building condition survey uh, expenditures are coming this year, water testing as well, which we do get aid on. Uh, reallocation of some of our project costs from the schools. Now with ESSA, uh, the Every, Every uh, Student Succeeds Act and the Transparency Act that we have to comply with. Um, putting these things in the building budgets 
now don't make any sense. These are centralized expenses, and they need to be put back in our buildings and grounds. Uh, because when we start to get compared, not only internally, school by school, but externally with other districts and other school by schools, um, just because we had to redo three classrooms in one building, now drives the cost of that building up and the education of those students up. And it really shouldn't because we provide chairs and desks to every student in the district. So it should be a central expense. Does that make sense to everybody? And increase new, new initiatives. Obviously, these are some of the things we talked about last time. Paving, refinishing gym floors, ceiling tile replacements, the loading dock at the Suffern High School. If you take a look, there's investment needed to that facade being replaced. <coughs> some case work and some painting throughout the district as we had already discussed. Um, technology uh, and BOCES and other uh, technology right now is actually coming down a little bit. Uh, we're working with that with uh, the MIT as we have also been talk talked about with managed IT. Uh, BOCES, this is without any special ed. Um, these are our numbers right now. And these are still, I believe, our, we've just finalized our, our stuff with BOCES. Um, so this, this number should be fairly good. I think it's, I think it's solid. Um, the, the, other, uh, the other numbers include uh, liability and casualty insurance and uh, a plan balance should also be in there in other, which you'll see. Here's just a graph if you're, if you're a very visual person and how it all breaks out between instructional costs. And you'll notice the big green bars are instructional costs and you'll notice employee benefits there is the blue one, uh, just two above it. Um, and as you would expect, basically our budget is more than, just a little, little more than 75%. Um, you know, salaries and benefits are exactly just the way it should be because as I say, we teach students, we do that with teachers, we don't build widgets. <laughs> so you need, you need people to teach students, just that simple. So that's what exactly what we would expect. We're, we're right in the realm where we are. Uh, anticipated revenues, you saw the plan balance. Of course, you saw the other side of that. Uh, that hasn't changed. Um, our health services, interest and investments. Um, the health services is actually going down because you'll see the note down there. We have a decrease in the number of, of East Maryland Post students. Uh, attending nine public schools here in our suffering central school district. Interest on investments, of course, as you can understand, uh, interest rates are going down. If you have paid any attention to the stock market in the last few days, you notice what the Fed did today, or actually was it yesterday. Half a point again and hit today, which was completely unexpected. You'll notice the stock market dropped about 800 points, and here we go. Who knows where the ride will end? We'll, we'll see. We'll all get out our crystal balls and see where we head. Uh, pilots, of course, didn't change uh, revenues from the pilots. Uh, state aid, our building aid, and BOCES aid, we saw these numbers from our, from our last meetings uh, as well. Uh, we'll go, go through a little bit more of this. Executive state aid proposal, I gave you this last time. These, these are the numbers. Just showing you, just a reminder, that we don't have anything yet from the legislative uh, side of the House. Uh, we'll probably not see that until April 1st. Uh, but for right now, we're going to kind of go with these numbers. And I'll point out again um, that the change in foundation aid, although it says $1.1 million, it's that total aid amount number that we need to pay attention to that says we're only going to go up about $80,000. That $20 million, 900000 in the middle, just above the 1.158 number is the number we need to pay attention to. Because as the governor has proposed it, I don't care how we manipulate those numbers above it, that $20,954,000 number will never change. So if we get more BOCES aid, because we spend more with BOCES aid this year, because that's how that's driven. Our foundation aid number on the top, that 11.6 number, will drop. <laughs> because they've wrapped everything up, rolled it right up, and called it all state aid. Okay? So just be aware of that, that we got that, oh, the foundation aid went up 1.1 million. No, pay attention to the bottom line, that 20,954,000 versus the $20,874,000. Only about an $85,000 plus increase there. That's it, that's what they're proposing. Okay? Don't, don't, be, don't be fooled by the sleight of hand, all right? And there's no guarantee you're gonna get that number. There's right? no guarantee. Yeah. All I can say is right now, I can tell you the history over the last five years is when a legislature has been done, everyone has experienced about a 30% increase from what the governor has proposed. What the governor has proposed. I say it one more time from what the governor has proposed. So, <laughs> all right. 
but that doesn't mean that will continue, obviously. Uh, use of debt service uh, in our other reserves, I mean, Daniel knows the asterisk there, the amount remaining in the debt service after use, and the amount needed to balance the budget. And you'll notice, again, I, I stress this is worst case scenario right now. We are still working on these numbers. We will come back in two weeks. We have hoping much better numbers. Uh, you know, for you to take a look at and, and options and solutions of where, where do we stand and how, how can we lessen this flow to our taxpayers and still get the job done and educate every child here in our district. Okay? So here's what we're looking at right now. Again, worst case scenario is if we came out with a tax levy increase of 2.87% and with a budget to budget increase of 4%. Our total proposed budget right now would be $146,200,814. Now, I'll remind everyone when we look at these numbers on the total revenue line, um, you'll, you'll notice that that's our budget. 141223 is our budget this year. So that means one, a 1% 1 increase in the budget going into next year is what? $141,000. So every $141,000 we can cut from the budget, we cut 1%. We have $30 million sitting in tertiary reserves. We have taxpayers that are moving out because they cannot afford the taxes in this school district. Our, our people who are senior citizens are moving out because they cannot afford the taxes. I'm gonna say this again. We need to have a 0% tax increase. I can't say this any more than I already have. We need a 0% tax increase. We have $30 million sitting in a tertiary reserve that does nothing for us. This is money that we have collected from taxpayers that are on, on fixed incomes. We are selling our houses. We are moving out of this district and the district is changing. We need to preserve our people who are living in these houses on, on fixed incomes and everybody else, we need to have a 0% tax increase. 2.87 is unacceptable. It needs to be a 0% tax increase. If anything, a 0% tax increase or give the taxpayers back some money that they have, that we are sitting there in our bank accounts earning interest on $30 million, give the taxpayers back some money or give them a 0% tax increase. 2.87 is unacceptable. Steve, do you have the tax cut numbers? I, I actually do, yes. Here's the numbers that, that you had just mentioned, and I, I will remind everyone too that the tax surgery numbers that you see on the top um, do have liabilities associated with them or potential liabilities associated with them. Um, I won't debate whether or not of that $22 million of the tax surgery is how much of that number needs to actually be held in a bank account. Um, that's, that's a board decision. Again, it's, it's all based on risk with, with the tax tertiary, although that looks like a very large number. Um, there are some very large corporations um, who hold that only because of um, those, those tax tertiary, because they fought their assessments, and, those, and that's the amount that they're fighting the reduction in the assessments. Um, I would say, I would also say this, I, I do have some numbers for you, for you folks as well. Um, I went through and I took a look at the tax levy increase that we proposed every year. And I would remind everybody that after, after the uh, certiorari refunds that we do give back, and these are the ones that are still, we're still fighting you know, back and forth, you know, I shouldn't say fighting, but still negotiating within the courts. Um, the, over the past six years, the average annual increase in the tax levy has been 0.98%, less than 1%. Now the tax rate increases, which you mentioned, had been 2.74, but that's not under our control. That's happening because the assessments are dropping. So, every for every one, so what that says is for every one percent that the school district increases its levy, the tax rate is actually is actually tripled because assessments have been dropping. So imagine what your tax rate 
increase would look like at 2.87% increase from the school district, and then with your assessments dropping, what would your tax increase really look like for the taxpayer? It needs to be zero starting from the district. What did you say the average was? The average tax levy increase has been 0.98%, less than 1% over the last six years. Over, okay, over the last six years. Correct, okay. Actually since, yeah, no, more than that. Actually since 2009-10. Uh, I went back to 2009-10. Ten, ten, ten years now. Sorry. Okay. So for the last 10 years, when you take a look at what the levy increase was, the dollar amount, and the dollar amount that was given back every year because of tax tertiary refunds, and a few years it was actually negative. What do you mean by what your rate was that you that you collected? So in other words, if I rate? wanted to raise, if I needed five hundred thousand dollars, just using round numbers, to support the local budget, there are some years where we gave back more than we collected to the taxpayers. In other words, there are some years instead of collecting five hundred thousand, I collected but had to give back six hundred thousand because of reduction in assessment. There are some years where that happened. You're telling me that my taxes went down in years. No. Because oh, remember okay. the rate. Remember, you've got, you got to compare apples to apples. Once the rate is established, it's established. No, I'm not talking about the rate. You're to, I'm talking about the district's rate. Forget about the assessment. That's correct. So you're telling me that the tax... The I have tax, the data right here. Can I see that? Absolutely. You'll all be given okay. copies and you'll be provided in the next, in the, in the next presentation as well. Yeah. In the next presentation, or this? Yeah, presentation? this will be part of the next presentation. You will actually see this tonight as, as well. This will be handed out to you folks as well. Okay. Back to the tax cards. Oh, yes. Sorry, I want to keep moving. No, that's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of, I'm trying to stay out of the way for this. Right? That's okay. Uh, do you happen to know? And you might not know this on the top of your head, but do you happen to know what percentage we currently or that we're currently holding tax cards at? I, I believe it's over 80%. Yeah. 86%. Okay. But we were at 100, obviously. This, that does not include what we will get this summer, though. No, no I understand. But that's a big, right. usual, right. like last summer, we got $6 million. Right. But right. right. well, we've always, up until this year, we've always held our tax rates at 100%. Right. right. The last we, year, we reduced that. Yeah, we that, number, money into it. That, that number has also been reduced again. You, you'll you see that that those numbers are actually as as of as though it was June 30th of this okay. year. We reduced those numbers by, by what we've given back so, so far. So as of right now, that number up there reflects somewhere in the range of 85% of what's outstanding. Don't quote me, but yes, I believe, give or take. Steve, the question with yeah. that, right? maybe I missed it, but. Uh, we were talking about the LED lighting going in for the budget for yeah. next year. Want to explain that a little bit again? Um, well, what we're going to be doing is is that we'll, in, in, I believe there's pieces in almost every building, every one of our buildings, uh, where we will be we will be changing out. So normal lighting that you see here, these fluorescent tubes, and going to a nice LED setup, you'll actually start to see them in here. Uh, we'll, we'll be putting a few in here to use as examples as well, so the taxpayers can see them during the meeting. Um, it's a very nice setup, and it should save us uh, quite a bit of money on our electricity costs. Um, they usually usually save anywhere between 60 to 75 percent, depending on the item uh, that you that you install. Uh, all right. So basically, next year we're going to be replacing all of the regular lighting and putting it into LED, um, and I think that's. Uh, that's a, uh, an item that has to be voted on, am I correct, or? It's gonna be one of the propositions. One of the propositions, like, like 1.8, but you will save within three years 30% of your utility bills. And once you can do that with your LED lighting, okay, then you can look ahead in terms of solar panels, which you can then also, in addition, save monies and maybe keep the budget down a little bit. Is this the time to ask for more money in the budget, or should I wait till later on? I think you should wait. Okay, yeah. Steve, I have a question also about out of district tuition rates. Um, what what are we as a district charging for tuition rates for out of district um, people who are. Well, I have that on top of my head. Do you have that through some top of your head? 
7,000 for elementary and 10. It's 11, I think. I think it was 11. 10 and 5. So those rates haven't gone up, even though we keep discussing having those rates increase over the years, we still haven't increased those rates. I believe it gets voted on in the summer by you. I think it gets voted on before we have to pass the budget. I'll check on that. Yeah. Because we have to. We, we keep saying that we're going to talk about it before we pass the budget because we keep saying that it has to get raised um, because it, it, it doesn't make sense that our children go to the school district. Um, you know, if we have one or two children and we're paying taxes, you know, my taxes are ridiculous living in the district. And when I had two kids, say my taxes, you know, for, for sending two kids are $10,000. But if I didn't live in the school district, I can send one of my kids for 7000 Well, it's cheaper for me not to live in the school district. That's not fair. So it doesn't give an incentive to move into the school district for people who are out of the school district. So I think that we need to make sure that those people who are sending their children to the school district are at least paying the same thing that we as, as people who are paying taxes who are living in the school district are paying. We shouldn't give somebody who's outside the school district a, a better deal than we ourselves who are living here. So I think that those rates should be increased. That's my personal feeling. And I know that some of the board members were feeling the same way. Um, and, and some of the, the residents who, who have come to me also felt the same way when they heard that, you know, what we were talking about. We had meetings and, and people were coming to the meetings and, and were, you know, voicing their concerns about tuition rates. We did, so years ago we did look at, and not just years ago, when we first did this program, we looked at the rates of the private and uh, non-public schools yeah. in the area, but also that we're, we compared them so that we could be competitive and also that we're also not providing transportation for them, remember? Correct. So it, you know, it depends what the, you know, that's up to you, but that was the whole thinking behind the rates that I think it's a good well, idea I, to do another comparative analysis. I, I compared, I, I printed out all of the rates for different schools um, when I first joined the board in July of 2018. Um, and you know, the, the rates that we compared to were really Catholic schools. And the Catholic schools, the reason why they keep the rates so low is because they're hoping that those children that go to Catholic schools stay within the Catholic church and they become members and they, you know, give tithes and stuff like that and they, you know, get attached to, to you know, staying within the religion and stuff like that, which makes sense. So they keep those tuition rates a little bit lower, um, you know, but I don't think it's quite fair to charge less to uh, to go to the school district when we live here and have to pay more. So that's just something that we as a board should think about. Um, going to private schools that were, were not religious in nature, we were well below those, those, um, those tuition rates. That was like, remember Horace Mann? Was you know that was like forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. That's a private school that's in, in the Bronx, um, and there were some other schools that I had pulled out. Um, but I, I think that if we keep it more towards them, what the tax rates are, we'd be okay. Well, I think if we take a look at Suffern, we were the number one rated in that niche survey. We were the number one rated district in Rockland County. So maybe we should charge as the number one rated. I mean, if you want the best, you're gonna have to pay for the best. So I, I think I think that definitely we have to talk about a methodology and a mindset of uh, enrollment versus get what you pay for. I, I think there has to be yeah. a balance there that has to. It's a great discussion. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you, you both have very good points. I don't I don't know what the methodology or the mindset was when they set the rates back some ten years ago. Um, Right, I think I think it's good to bring to the floor and have another discussion about it and have a comparative analysis that everyone can look at. 
and make sense of it. But I think we need to do it before the budget is yes. set. Well, so well, absolutely, it, it, absolutely. I, I agree. This is the time to discuss it, but the rate normally will be established again during the July meeting when you have your when you have your annual meeting when you establish that rate normally for the next school year because you have that meeting annual meeting would normally happen in July, and then the rate would be charged obviously September first when you know, children come come to school. But the time to talk about it and anticipate what revenue you would get would be now. You're absolutely correct. Okay. So is that something that we can prepare? Sir, to discuss at the next workshop sir, on the seventeenth. Sir, without a doubt, but we can discuss it more right. depth with more. Because we can, we can information. Then, we can then canvass all the, all the, all the public and private schools that we possibly can get numbers for. And also, if we can have like how many how many students are are coming? I think the last time we did an analysis, it was seventeen students. So if we can also have an analysis of how many. Thank you. Right. Yeah. All right, Steve. Of the uh, 667 school districts in the state, Suffern Central is ranked as number 40. So obviously we must have a pretty good school system and the benefits in terms of a great education. The very good school system. Mm -hmm. uh, there ha and obviously the, the people in, in the uh, uh, district are paying for that. So I think people who want to come into the district uh, should also have that opportunity. Steve, I wanted to ask a question um, regarding the technology. Um, you said that we're paying $137,000 less this coming year on, on the um, anticipating expenditures. What's the reason behind that? Why I'll have to talk to less? Eric on that and, and get a... We can, we can go over that number right off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but just looking currently, I think Emma, some of the MIT stuff came, came into Evolve and some of our combining of servers and things like that. I know that we did some extensive work on our um, infrastructure in the schools uh, last year, and with moving to this managed IT, we should be saving some money on that. There was also some talk that we um, that we were, we were going to have like a second IT uh, person come in to work with Eric. Is that with our managed IT? Is that going to be something that's necessary? That I don't know the inner workings of. You, you can. So, um, so we currently have one fewer IT professionals than we had a year ago. And so um, I have tasked uh, Mr. Coronado with determining what level person would be the best person to bring in. Like what are our needs? So I'm giving him some time to determine what, what is it that we need and then matching that position to what our needs are. So before we had the managed IT, we were talking about bringing two, uh, two people. Well, Eric is one of the two. Right. One Eric being is Eric, who's back there. Okay. <laughs> the other one being a, cer a certified, the Eric is civil service. Oh, no, that's it. I was talking about a different discussion. I was talking about replacing the other technician that is no longer here. Okay, so the, the the other certified and certificate parts we don't need as a result of the marriage. Not right now, it's not in the budget. Okay. Because I just and the other reason I was asking about the um the hundred thirty seven thousand dollars less is there, and I said it in the last meeting there's a student that comes in here Matt Bogan comes in and, and says our Chromebooks are broken our iPads are outdated. Um, you know, we have issues with our Wi-Fi at the high school where you can't log in on the Wi-Fi and it just seems to me if that's the case that, you know, for us to be spending less money than well, we are spending. I'll, I'll say this, remember when we purchase equipment, a lot of that equipment, some of this is state aid equipment and some of it is BOCES equipment that we buy. Mm -hmm. So there's two different arenas that, that we, for, for bundles of money or silos of money that, you right. that we have to spend for. Mm -hmm. So he's also using BOCES, obviously, so we get aid on the equipment right, as well. Okay. Right. Thank you. Can I ask a question of Eric? It's yes. my understanding that the, the Wi-Fi at the high school is just not connected. It just when the, it's it's not that difficult of, of a situation to. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, sorry. right. I'm, I'm just kind of asking if he wants me to answer it. Okay. It's not a technical issue, it's a pedagogical choice. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank what you. Is, what does that mean in English? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. It's not, our Wi Fi 
our, our Wi-Fi is available. All of our school, all of our district-owned devices are connected to the Wi-Fi. Our teachers are allowed to have their devices uh, connected to our Wi-Fi. Our students, we have not made, um, we don't have a formal plan yet for allowing our students to bring their own devices and log into our Wi-Fi. It's not that it can't be done, it's that it hasn't been done. Why? There's some pedagogical issues around it so that if students are doing things that are Wi-Fi, there's some things about, um, when they're using our device, we can track everything they do. Um, when they're using their device, we can't do that. But you can block sites and stuff oh, like absolutely. that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All absolutely. That. All, if there, our filters would all be the same, right. but they could do things on their devices that we wouldn't be able to track. So there's a security issue. So they, what you're saying, the issues are more on their personal devices rather than rather than on school devices correct the school devices that they get it's fine it's right. fine it's connected to wi-fi and we can track everything they do if that's what he's complaining about forget it. that's not <laughs> <laughs> that's not he, he shouldn't be using his phone it's when that's the case she's using his school ipad does anybody does anybody else up here have any questions i just have a couple okay um if we go back to the staffing modifications yeah slide um, this is the first time in a while that I don't see any FTE reductions. And that's a good thing, but I just want to know that that's accurate based on our enrollment and everything else. To you'll, notice, you'll notice the question mark there. And the question mark is not only just for retirements, but it's also for the right. whole sentence that says other FTE modifications. Okay. Because again, enrollment play is going to play a big piece. Um, and, and what's happening, you know, with new kindergarten, and uh, we're starting a, a brand new uh, pre-K, you know, full, full year program this year as well. We'll, we'll need staff for that. Um, so uh, there are still some things in the work that works that we need to um, ferret out and, and figure out um, what the final numbers will be, you know, staffing wise. Um, we have some, you know, things, you know, middle school as well with enrollment, you know, from, from coming from the elementary to the middle school and, and the number of teens and and uh, I know Lee is hard at work talking with the principals, uh, and she's been communicating with myself and Teresa, um, and keeping us addressed of those conversations. Okay. And I wanted to do, go back to the public relations position, and I, maybe I just don't understand, maybe I'm missing how we capture that with BOCES currently and how much of that is funded by BOCES and how much of that's funded by us or how that how that works right now with the point six. Yeah, good. So there's a max of thirty five thousand. Right. Well, currently um, I'll have to go back and review. I, I believe what's happening is is we're up against the salary cap of that, but if we're not we're getting approximately uh, you know, like fifty eight percent aid back on, on that expenditure. Okay. Um, I believe the the decision or the thought process was we really like somebody full time. Mm -hmm. If that's not the case, then that then that's a whole different story and realm to go down mm -hmm. and road to go down. If you're happy with three days a week, you're happy with three days a week, and what we can do moving forward to market and sell ourselves and and, and looking at your strategic plan uh, process moving forward. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I. I think that having a full time is. I'm trying to get in touch with Don. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Yes. And just, and just what Don has mentioned, you, you are the best of the best. Right. You're you're in that top 15 schools in the state, as you have mentioned. I, I mean, 40. Or 40, I'm sorry. 6, 6, but, 7. But, uh, you know. You're it. Yeah, but the first 39 don't see it. <laughs> well, I'm just, right? there's, there's an issue with the first I, I'm 39. I'm just saying, you, you do have a great school. You provide you know, wonderful opportunities for students. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And to continue that, um, you know, we talk about attracting, wanting to attract parents and students here. You provide so many opportunities that you need to sell that. You need to market that. And to do that, you need someone to do that. I certainly don't disagree. Um, do a comment? Well, all right, so we're not going to talk about some, some things that we would like to add to the 
budget yet. We're going to save it for next next week. And if you'd like to, by all means, I'll take notes. Okay, let me start. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. See, I, I, I won't stop out. you. That's why we're here. It's a workshop. Okay. This was an opening for Don. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the warm-up person. Okay. <laughs> Just follow the yellow sweater. Okay. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, what I, I'd like to congratulate the uh, athletic teams for all of they, what they've accomplished lately in the sports and so forth. And one of the things that they get is bus transportation. They get, uh, I think it's $887,000 worth of transportation each year for buses, for athletic competition. We have also academic co uh, competitive teams, or clubs as they're calling them here, which for some reason was never put in the budget so that they could be provided for bus transportation. I understand, and I've done some research on it with regards to other schools and so forth, by the, if you put in the amount of money in a budget line for bus transportation for your competitive uh, academic teams, such as DECA, which did a fantastic job, and also the robotics program, which is doing a fantastic job, we can then cover those. What I would like to ask is that we uh, allocate $75,000 into the budget for bus transportation for all of the competitive academic teams that are sponsored by the uh, Suffern uh, Central School District, okay? Including the entrance fees for those events, which I understand has been done previously to this, but unfortunately, you know, I've been to Bagel Express, I've been to uh, Bagel Train, okay, on the Saturdays where the, the robotic students, they're gonna be going to uh, Utica for the state championship, and they have to raise the money for the bus to go. And, you know, I think some of the people there were purposely, you know, donating because they felt sorry for the kids out in front, freezing. And, you know, you couldn't do it another day because they're leaving on March 13th and 14th. We understand that, okay? Um, we've gotten some donations to get them on that bus, hopefully for this year. But for next year, really, you know, if you have, you know, you're talking about a great school system, you know, and we're doing pre-K, that should bring in some younger families with children, but you want to keep them here. And one of the ways to do that is to have, you know, fantastic athletics, uh, cultural programs and so forth, but also the priority should be the academic programs and we should allocate bus transportation, okay, for any uh, academic competitive team, okay? That's my spiel on that one. I'd also uh, like to um, request $25,000 be put in the budget for a marketing committee, okay, composed of people in uh, the uh, uh, district, business, political, board, administration, faculty, and let's sell the district. Do you realize that some of the people in, in the community don't even know that there's a planetarium, okay? And how can it be used? How can we sell that? Can you bring in senior citizens, for example, and show them how it works? Not only that, you're gonna see Orion on the ceiling, but do you realize that they're teaching anatomy and physiology in, in the planetarium? There are lots of different programs that we have whether it be the cultural or whatever. So, you know, let's try to sell the district here. You have to remember when this budget is uh, going to be approved, okay, most of the people who will be approving that budget do not have children in the school system. Why should they vote yes to approve a budget, okay? Well, one of the reasons why you want to do it is to sell the district, to say, this is what we have. Also, one of the things about having a great school system is that's what keeps your value of your houses up, okay? Uh, if you're you know, uh, going to a place where uh, the school system is not as good, okay, your house, your house values, okay, are not as good either. Okay, so we have all those things in, in suffering, but we have to get them out. And I think uh, rather than uh, hiring someone for the extra two days with the benefits and everything else, if we put that committee together and sell the district, okay, um, you know, look what we can do, okay? And I think the 100,000 total, okay, will increase, okay, the um, feeling that the district is really the top 40, but, you know, I'd like to make it in Paul down to the uh, top one or two. And I turn the Remember, forget microphone. about the other 39. <laughs> and I turn my, the microphone over to Paul. Shapiro. Paul. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I'm whispering in my ear. I'm talking about how uh, my... No, no, it's, the, it's the sweater's too bright. I'm sorry. 
Thank you very much. Well. Okay. Well, all right. I want to second every everything that Don said. Um, look, we're number one in the county. We're probably number one in the lower Hudson, Hudson Valley. You can talk about Scar Scarsdale. Forget about that. Okay. I know Scarsdale very very well. Uh, they don't they don't compare to us. All right. Um, Edgemont that broke away from Scarsdale many years ago when most of you weren't even around. Um, I will tell you that uh, they've gone down to the point where they don't even have a hockey team anymore and they had it combined with the other three schools and we still beat them five to one, so that wasn't any, anything. We are, we are terrific. We should go out there and bang the drum slowly, but bang it loud and let, let people know about us. So, I mean, $100,000, after, after we pair, pair this down to about 140, then we can add the $100,000 and it's not gonna hurt us. It'll be down there in the long run. Well, I know. I'm going to say, look, but very well said. Million 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 and points well taken. Thank you. Definitely second thoughts. A motion. And motion. Moved. Second. <laughs> Any other comments on Don's proposals? I don't mean in a negative way. <laughs> just before I talk about something else, I want to just make sure everybody has it. The opportunity to say something. Okay, that's good stuff. Okay, um, back to your slides. Um, I, I, can you just go back and maybe just elaborate a little bit more on the centralized expenses and how those dollars are being moved from where they are today yeah. to where they're going? Right. Basically, uh, because of the Every Student Succeeds Act and transparency reporting requirements. Now, every school district in the state um, is now reporting um, their expenditures by building and by program. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about the last time, analytics, 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 data, data, data. Our data is being mined, um, analysis are being done, trends are being made. So, that being said, I'll give you an example. RP counter fourth and fifth grade classroom furniture. Okay. <coughs> now, locally, those two classrooms, and I just I'll just throw out round numbers, maybe ten thousand dollars a piece for furniture. It could be a hundred thousand dollars a piece for furniture, depending on the type of classroom, if there's special education, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. You now take that building and you count you take a look at its expenditures. And now they I won't say they're artificially high, but they're high for the fourth and fifth grade. So now, people start to take a look at test scores and the amount you spend per child in fourth and fifth grade, not only within our district, but now within every district in the state, and go, wow, in fourth and fifth grade in R.P. Connor, um, the cost per child in those rooms is $9 more than any other, <laughs> than any other classroom in the state. How can that be what happened? They don't care what happened. Then they start to take a look at the state exams and go, but wait a minute, they didn't perform any better than anyone else. Or they didn't perform any better than they did the prior year. But wait a minute. So now there is an expectation that if you're spending more money, you will get more results. <laughs> or something as simple as furniture. Yes, I, I understand. So that's what we're trying to, to prevent is that every child deserves a chair and a desk to sit at. So we don't want to skew our own numbers internally or externally. And so things, things that every child gets, like computers, again, that's something else. Again, the same thing that goes, it's a central cost. So in other words, that cost gets spread across the district numbers equally instead of just one building. So where will these, so where will those numbers be seen in this year's budget? Will they be you will the, see them, you notice the increases, in talk, we were talking about so, buildings and grounds, if you look at the slide behind you, right, right, there, but, right there, you see that million dollars? Yeah. There it is. Okay. So that's, up, that's why I think the unit cost is going up to 22.93% because we're moving it. Do we ever break out, I mean, I want to say this in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You have five examples on your buildings and grounds slide for five different schools. So you have a budget for each one of those schools, which is inflated. Because you have, 
It could be. Because you have to design the In the past, the practice has been to put them in the school's right. budget. So now the building take, budget. Correct. Now you take them out of that budget. You take them out of the school's budget. Where do, do where do they go? Does it go to is there is there a Hillburn? Right there, buildings and grounds is district wide. So that's just a district wide buildings and grounds as opposed to right. a individual school building right. and grounds. Buildings and grounds is again it's just what a, we call the central expense, okay. which means it's spread across the whole district, okay. every building equally. So we basically allocate those costs based on the number of students right. versus just putting all the costs in one Okay. Especially like something like school for that's a big project that would highly inflate right. your costs. So now we spread with all okay. Right. okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Who's, whose brainchild was this in, in the state? Oh, I, I got <laughs> it. <guess. laughs> right, because they don't, they don't want to take credit for it because when you sit, sit back and, and listen to them, well, it, you know, we need, we need new fur furniture. If, if children were sitting in desks that had splinters and chairs that had splinters <coughs> and we you know, did the best and we bought whatever it was and, and so the test scores didn't didn't go up so they're going to say I'll say I'll say it's a work in progress it's not necessarily the New York State Education Department is doing this it's also out outside groups that are doing this that do nothing but study um, the cost of education and the product on the other end right. and and again it's compare can trend or compare, the trend, trend compare and analyze right. everything and it is very difficult to superimpose um, a science like math on an art, right. which is teaching. Because as we know, if you have multiple children, um, and I always say this to people, if you have more than one child, would you ever mistake one for the other? No. Do, do they learn the same? No, they don't. Does it potentially cost a little bit more for one than it does the other? Yes. Potentially it does. But now we're trying to superimpose again that science of it should cost X number of dollars per student, not taking in the variable of the capabilities of the student. And the supports each student needs to reach his or her full potential. That's again, I'll call it a mistake of superimposing the science over and art. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. High levels, yes, you can do it in generalities. But no, no school district across this state is the same. No population is the same. Our children in this room are not the same. None of them. I know someone in here who has twins and she wouldn't mistake one for the other. <laughs> Just saying. If you have multiple children, I'm sure you wouldn't, you wouldn't matter. I'll say. I don't know. You wouldn't just take one child for the other. <laughs> so basically, if, okay. if the, uh, the children are sitting in rickety old chairs and score very well, what does that give them? What, what, what does well, that mean that to means, Again, like any, like any, if you were, if you were, not to use Avon as an example, but if you were looking at earnings per share, I would say the cost to provide that product was very lean. And, and my earnings per share should be very high. Right. Now you have a very good graduation rate here. You have a very good product at the other end. You're producing a very well-educated and civic-minded child at the other end. Now, what is that worth? It's worth different amounts to different folks, as you just mentioned. We can go from a zero increase all the way to, we're gonna to get to what we pay for, we should raise tuition to, wait a minute, we need to market, we're the greatest school district in the state and in the country. It, all, it runs the gamut of where is that cost, what are you comfortable with paying? That's different in each district. It really is, it, it really is. You, you gave Scarsdale as a great example. No, please, they're a terrible example. I hope, I hope no one, uh, <laughs> Again, it's the, it's, it's the mindset, the mindset, the ability to pay, the ability to want to pay, and what you expect at the other end. And are you getting that expectation? Right. If expectations are being met, people are happy, 
They're willing to pay their taxes, like you had mentioned. Many people pay taxes here that don't have children in the district. They do that all across the state because they realize it takes a village and their grandparents, and they want to see their grandchildren do well. They want to see their, you know, what, whatever relationship they may or may not have. Again, they realize that if we screw up the next generation, we're responsible for that. We shouldn't screw it up. Are we really want, want to talk about, oh, if we save 50 cents per child, we would have, I don't know, I, I don't know. That's not an argument. It's like you said before. It's like you said before, though. Just throwing money at the problem doesn't necessarily. Absolutely, fix it. it's all. It's, it's again. It's all I relevant. Will say the science. The science is very important. Metrics are always very important because you always want to know where you've been, where you are, and where you'd like to be. And the metrics will help you get there. In any still in the planning process. situation, that's why you're doing that right now. That you're taking a look at enrollment numbers and, and, and building costs and everything. You're going. You're going to be getting into. Uh, but quite a bit of very important stuff where you're going to be needing metrics and you're going to be analyzing that metrics and you're going to be analyzing quantitative and qualitative items that are going to be just as important whether it has a number or not again we talk about that feeling of this is what i like at the other end i'm not sure if listening to you makes me feel a lot smarter or a lot dumber <laughs> I didn't mean to become a philosopher sitting here. I apologize. That's not what I meant to do tonight. <laughs> but if I if I gave anyone an education out there, you're welcome. I hope I I hope I if I've done nothing else, I hope I've done. That. I have one last question. Yes, sir. Um, on the new initiative, the proposed new initiative. Do we at this point have any kind of ballpark for what that might cost? And you know, and, and not individually, but do we have an idea? where all these may fall in terms of what this, the cost is. There have been estimates that have been done. Um, right now we're looking at some of these and going, we're, we're not sure that they're they're going to come in within the estimates because they're a few years old. Uh, some of them like the, the facades, uh, like mm -hmm. the high school, the new entrances and things like that. Uh, because there's a lot of projects out there right now. And you know, there's the old saying is, as more work is out there, golden hammers start to get swung, yep. if you will, because again, supply and demand, I'll go back to again, um, when you have a lot of demand and a, a little supply to fill it with, prices go up. Um, that's all I can say. I, 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 I wish I got, you're, you're not giving me a number. I can't give you a number, okay. because I, I, okay. can't, I can't say whether they'll come in 20% higher than you think, or they'll come right on the money, or 20%, I, I don't think they're going to come in lower, I really don't. I think they're going to come in higher. And I think we're going to be looking at possibly value engineering some of our thoughts and, uh, and possibly maybe even looking at some, some other alternatives. Okay. When we, when we have our next workshop on the 17th, do you think we'll have any more data for this so that we can really start to piece together the budget and all of our expenses? I, I think we will. I think we'll have some. Uh, but some of these things you're not going to know until you actually go out and, and did those. Well, we can tell them what, what we're going to put in the budget. Yeah, as an estimate right, correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, well, you'll have the numbers of what each one we're going to put in the budget, what we think are, is going to be that ballpark. But it doesn't mean we might have a number of the budget doesn't mean we're going to finish all these well, with that dollar. So yeah, right, but right. Because we have to at least have an idea of what we're, what we're potentially looking at. Because we're looking at our ability to pay with our own reserve and obviously our tax. Right. All right, I'm done. Okay. Is it any, anybody else? Or are we going to let Steve sit down? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.
So now at this time we will reconvene the meeting of the Suffolk Central School District Board of Education for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. Please rise for the pledge. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heather, I know we're stickless for the time. It's 8.20. Okay. Uh, do we have a student report tonight? Yeah. We do. Hi, I'm Olivia Blau, I'm a senior at Suffern High School. Nice to see you all again. Um, so tomorrow night, there's a college information, information session at the middle school. And then on Thursday, there's an academic week invitational. I think that's at the high school. Didn't really get too much detail on that. Um, and then on Saturday, there's the STEAM Expo at the high school, and that's from 11 to 3.30. And then spring sports starts start March 9th, which is this upcoming Monday. And the spring musical performances start March 16th, and they're Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and then Saturday is a, there's a matinee performance for the understudy cast. And then starting the 16th, and that's through the 19th of March, uh, Vietnam veterans are visiting the high school. And that's all I have for you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minutes of the regular meeting for February 4th, 2020. Uh, do I have a motion? Move. Mr. Cairns? Second? Second. Is that Mr. Donovan? Yes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those against? Any abstentions? Abstain. Shapiro abstains. Okay. Acting superintendent comments. We have an exciting weekend coming up in Suffern Central. As just mentioned, we have the STEAM Expo on Saturday at the high school. The basketball team will be competing Friday night at the county center in the sectional semifinals. The hockey team will be competing on Saturday against a um, team from Section 2, and they're playing right now, so as soon as they finish that game, we'll know who our opponent is. That's Saturday night. If the basketball team wins on Friday, they'll play on Sunday night. Um, the middle school play is coming up. That's next week. The high school play is in two weeks. Um, and on a very early Monday morning, our Southern Robotics team will be featured on uh, WNBC. That's very exciting. Uh, this week is School Social Workers Week, so I wanted to just um, give a little shout out and thanks to our wonderful district-wide um, social workers, Jane Taylor, Heather Bono, Jackie Fry, and Marianne Walsh. I'd also like to invite everyone to join me in our um, March Forward Suffern program. There's information on social media and on our website, encouraging everybody to get out in March and walk and see how many steps you can walk and use the hashtag March Forward Suffern and um, log your activity. There will be um, prizes and highlighting of the activity of all, everyone's welcome to do this, students, staff, and community <coughs> members. Can, can, can we go back a minute sure. more, and just tell me a little more or tell everybody a little more about the robotics and ABC? NBC. NBC. Okay. Mr. Cairns, would you like to? Oh. Actually, anyway, never mind. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I happened to run into someone from uh, uh, Channel 4 and NBC and um, we sold them on the, the idea of coming up and looking at a robotics program, which is 21st century ed, uh, education. <coughs> and they bought it in terms of, uh, it is 21st century, we have females who are going into engineering, uh, and it's a program where the students who are in that program are getting scholarships to college, okay, and then going on. 
For example, last year one student received a, uh, five um, acceptances and a total of $378,000 worth of scholarships. And that was just one student, okay? So um, they are coming uh, on uh, Monday morning. Uh, I can tell you right now, you can, uh, you'll see them. Uh, they'll be live on uh, NBC at 5.42 a.m., 6.42 a.m., and then live uh, at the 6 a.m., they'll be doing a tease there, and then it'll play at 4.30 p.m. Uh, later on, and again during the weekend. And hopefully we can get that and put it on our Facebook. Uh, it's really, you know, there are a lot of robotics programs in the state of New York. One of the best ones happens to be here uh, in Suffern, so it's an example of why we should put bus transportation certainly into their budget. But, uh, <laughs> it's an excellent opportunity. I'd also like to thank uh, Orange and Rockland Utilities who came uh, yesterday. Uh, they presented the robotics program with a grant of $5,000 for um, product and so forth. So uh, we have that. Uh, and also, uh, Chestnut Ridge Transportation donated $1,000 uh, for transportation up to Utica, which is not even half of that amount uh, at this point. So, uh, really, very generous. you should be you know, very happy in terms of where the robotics program is. They did that program last Saturday, which was robotics uh, a workshop for all the children in the district. Uh, and, you know, it's a program that, you know, not only uh, we have it at the high school, but I would like to think that we really have to develop a full program from the elementary to the junior high where we do not have a program yet, and we should, and then move it on because any job in the future is going to require robotics, whether it be surgery uh, or, you know, accounting something. So, so you know, uh, tune in early, but if you don't tune in early, I assure you we'll have it on Facebook shortly after that, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you, excellent. Public, do you have more? No, I'm good. Uh, public participation. This is public participation on action items only. Each, each individual will have up to three minutes to speak. Total session time will last for 30 minutes. If you would like to address anything having to do with action items only, please, um, please approach the podium. Okay. Seeing as we have no takers, we'll close this portion of the meeting and move to action items. So this is action items 2.01 through 2.25. Are there any items that wish to be pulled at this time? Agenda. This will be for action items 2.01 through 2.04, 2.06, 2.07, 2 2.10 through 2.13, and 2.15 through 2.25. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Moved. Mr. Shapiro, is there a second? Second. Mr. Cairns? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Any abstentions? Okay, so let's go back now to 2.05 quarterly report. Do I have a motion? 
Motion. Mr. Cairns. Chair, second. Second. Mr. Shapiro. Discussion. I just uh, asked for um, Steve to go through it just to give a little synopsis for the board and for the public. Okay. Um, in looking at our quarterly report, uh, when, you, when you take a look at it against your treasurer's report as well, um, you will see that you will see that the district is actually very on track uh, with the prior year expenses uh, and revenues, and uh, in fact, we're within two percent uh, of where we were in the prior year. So everything uh, appears to be uh, on track with both our revenues and expenditures thus far. Um, that that would be the summary that I would have. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Good. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. 2.08, small claims settlement 2019 2020. These are both together 2.08 and 2.09. Okay. Um, but we pulled them so we have to vote on them separately. Okay. So 2.08, we'll do first. Small claim settlement. For 1920, is there a first? Moved. Move, move. Mr. McKenzie? Yep. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Shapiro? Discussion. Um, I was just wondering because there's like backup, um, and I was wondering with the backup, you know, these are our small claim assessment changes. Are these coming from like the assessor's office? Are these uh, assessment changes, you know, that went through court? Like, what did are these? You see the backup? Did you see the backup? I only saw the backup on 2.09, not on 2.08. I sent you the backup on 2.09. Right. They're both the, they, there was different backup that was attached to 2.08, and then it changed. No, 2.09. The one that you questioned was the one that changed. The numbers got changed, I think. Right. The wrong backup was provided. Right. The there was the wrong, we, the wrong, it was a purchase order was sent instead of the, right. um, yeah. so and that then, was then reattached correctly and then in the email was attached the backup for that one. I, and now I'm looking at both of them. So okay. that's why, that's why I pulled both of these. So looking at them, it's like a memo that's signed um, by Ms. I sold the for a small claim settlement. I recommend the Board of Ed approve the following small claim assessment cha changes for 1920 school year. And then it's talking about these parcel idea IDs. So it's got the names and addresses. That came through the court system if it says small claims. So it was through the court system. If it says small claims, absolutely. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So like these are just like a list of the properties. So mm -hmm. there's no no court backup with it. So there's nothing coming from like the town of Ramapo or any court documents. It's just giving me like a memorandum. Usually we have like court documents attached to it. So that, that's all I'm saying. I don't know if you wanna just email it to me. Thank you. Because usually that whole thing comes in Yeah, normally we have a summary judgment to come, come along with it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else on this? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Any abstentions? Abstain. Ms. Raymer? Abstains. Okay. Motion passes. 2.09. This is small claim settlement for 2017-2018. Is there a motion? Yeah. Move. Mr. Shapiro, is there a second? Second. Mr. McKenzie, discussion? Sustained. There's just not enough backup. Okay. Please get it forward that so okay. I can see it. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Any abstentions? Abstain. Ms. Raymer, abstains. Okay. 2.14. This is the 2020-21 district calendar. Do I have a motion? Moved. Mr. McKenzie, is there a second? Second. Mr. Cairns, discussion. 
Last year, we got a calendar. Um, it was voted on and approved um, by the superintendent, brought it to the board, and then we had a re-vote on the calendar. It was like a big deal, and that was because the calendar did not match the rest of the school districts in Rockland County. I just thought that it was just BOCES that it didn't match, but it was the whole school, all of the school districts within Rockland County. Not, it wasn't all of them, it was some. It, was some, some. it I, matched some, no, but not we, others. We were the only district that was off a different time in April. So when the calendar was originally started last year, it was started under the superintendent, it was inherited by me. Um, when I asked, it had been vetted. However, other districts and then a great number of other districts all changed their calendar without this district knowing it. So we had passed the calendar. I went to the first BOCES meeting afterwards. They were all in line and we were the one that was off at that time, which is why we changed it. It was the April vacation that was off. So we had the whole week. We now, the week we have off, we, we originally had the week before that off, we were the only ones with that week off. Everyone had the 8th through whatever is the 16th now. Um, everyone had that off. We were the only ones for this year that were not going to have it that way, so we switched it. That, that was the revote that we did. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page before we vote on the calendar. Okay. So we're not on the same page, and I'll explain why. Le next year's calendar is very tight. It's a very late Labor Day, and so Labor Day isn't until September 7th. Um, there are some districts in our county who, by their teacher's contract, cannot bring staff back prior to Labor Day. There are some districts that can. So this is a year where districts who can bring back um, staff before Labor Day, some of them are choosing to take that option. In fact, one district is bringing students back before Labor Day. So really, this is the year of different calendars. How that plays out, um, so, so the, that, that's the start of the differences. So some districts are bringing staff only, some districts are, one district is bringing staff and students, and other districts are not bringing anyone back before Labor Day. So that creates a little like a two, three, possibly four day swing from one district to the next. Um, Rock and Boses has not passed their calendar yet. It's still in draft form. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of days sort of that then become the days that are different um, among the districts. And those days um, start in December with December 23rd. Some districts have December 23rd off. We are one of those districts, which is a Wednesday. Some districts do not have Wednesday the 23rd off. Some have school that day. So the December 23rd, after the September stuff, is the first difference in calendars. The next difference in calendars is the February break. Some districts have the full week off. Some districts have two days off. So that's a difference across the county. The next date that varies is April 5th. Um, next year, the, uh, you know, the April-ish vacation spans the end of March to the beginning of April, um, which uh, Passover goes from Saturday to Sunday. That Sunday, April 4th, is Easter. So some districts has, have April 5th off. In our proposal, April 5th is listed as a school day, but would be the last snow day we give back. If we didn't use three snow days, if we only use, if we use zero, one, or two snow days, we'll be off on April 5th. And then the next variance is around the Memorial Day weekend. So because we have the shorter time, less time off in February, we have another day to play with, and so we have, February, we have a May 28th off. Um, most districts have school that day, though for many districts it's like a fluff snow day if we don't use it. Um, the advantage of having May 28th in there is we have three days planned into this calendar. If for some reason we needed a fourth snow day, we could use May 28th and not lose any days off of the April vacation. So those differences you're gonna find in all the calendars this next year are gonna look a little different around those days. 
but that was similar this year. There were days like that still this year. The, the reason why we changed it was that full week would be gone. There, there are scattered days even in this year's calendar that didn't match up. It never matches up completely. Right, because I know that, that they're week. off. They're off like some some calendars. I think like Clarkstown, they have in the teachers contract, they may be wrong, that they have to have off February. So that whole week in February, they're closed, where we were only three days off. So this year, we're only two days off. Okay. As long as everybody's not to, And there's nothing we could do about coming before Labor Day. It's contractual, right? Um, we could bring our staff back before Labor Day. It's not preferred. We can't bring, well, we did have, have students. Um, we did a couple years ago. So a couple of years ago, the difference was we had a late Labor Day, but we also lost three days in September to the Jewish holidays. We lost two for Rosh Hashanah and one for Yom Kippur. This year, Rosh Hashanah falls on a weekend, so we don't lose those days as school days this year. That's the difference with this year's calendar as opposed to the 15-16 calendar when we did bring folks back. Any other, any other discussion, conversation? No? We're good to vote? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Act items are complete. Uh, information items. 4.01 National School Breakfast. If I might, I'd like to just note everyone to, to notice that this year, this coming week, is National School Breakfast Week. And this Thursday morning, um, our school district and our school board has graciously offered free breakfast to every student in our district who would like to take advantage of that. Um, we're doing this, uh, obviously, to increase our own participation in school breakfast within the district, um, but not only to do that, to help Obviously, hungry children don't learn well. I probably didn't say that as well as I should have, but I will say this. We're looking for improved academic performance. We're looking to improve children's diets and obviously improve children's behavior. Because children who are well-fed and happy, learn well, behave well, perform well. So I would like again to everyone to, to notice our website. I believe, I, if not this evening, by tomorrow morning, the website will also have, um, uh, you, you will see uh, the, the note go up on our website, Facebook, Instagram, and everything else that we do, uh, promoting and marketing this. And I'd like to thank, uh, you know, Janet, uh, our director um, of our food service program. She's doing a great job, um, and she's got all the folks together. Uh, and, and reading and transportation and, and uh, those folks, uh, they're going to try to bring the kids in just a few moments early and get them off the bus and get them in there so they can eat breakfast. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, our uh, next information item will be a coronavirus update. Yes. All right. So hopefully everybody received our communication this afternoon, um, which provides some information about what we're doing in the district related to the coronavirus. Um, really, the most important, your most important takeaway is wash your hands frequently. And I can tell you that every time I have said or read coronavirus over the last week makes me want to run and go wash my hands. But um, we've also um, spoken with our principals to talk to our teachers about increasing opportunities and reminding students to wash their hands, reminding students that we have sanitizers in all of our common areas um, in our buildings. Uh, our custodial staff has increased their frequency of wiping down surfaces, frequently touched surfaces, doorknobs, railings, um, etc. cetera. Um, we also, um, sort of the, um, the unknown of what may happen has provided us the opportunity to look more thoroughly at some of the plans we have in place related to 
um, infectious diseases, what would the impact be on instruction, if students need to stay home, if staff needs to stay home, if large groups of students need to stay home. A technology readiness plan to help um, alleviate that situation, uh, transportation, and um, how would we maintain business operations I mean, in, the, in the case we do not believe you know, that we're not saying that's going to happen, we just want to be ready for it. We're working very closely with all of the districts throughout the county and um, receiving information uh, frequently from New York State and uh, from the CDC. And I, I think that Dr. Nick Pond has spent a lot of time on this too recently and may want to share a few thoughts too. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a uh, long couple of weeks uh, since this all broke out. And I want to speak uh, a couple of different things. Uh, you know, from a school district standpoint, I think I commend uh, Lee and her staff for uh, reaching out uh, to different school districts, to uh, the Departments of Health, to have a conversation and really uh, get some preparations in place, because I think uh, this is an ever-evolving situation. And if you read the news, go on social media, um, it's really important to try to you know get as informed as possible but also remember where that information is coming from and try to get sources of information that are accurate. Uh, I'll refer people to the cdc.gov uh, website is phenomenal. They have uh, media transcripts and updates every day um, and they track uh, the science of it and uh, updates on vaccines and stuff like that. So that's a really good source of accurate information. Um, I think the unknown uh, is worrying a lot of people and just on a personal level with uh, dealing with my patients, uh, we get a lot of questions about um, what do we do? You know, what, what do we, or should we be worried? Should we be concerned? And the answer is, you should be concerned, but but be practical. And the best thing to do is hand washing and staying home when you're sick. And those have been proven across the board for all outbreaks, flu outbreaks, uh, uh, past outbreaks. So that's what we talk to our patients about hand washing all the time um, and, and just staying home when you're sick. And I think if people are doing that, then I think that's important. Another big point, too, is the spectrum of severity of illness. So there are people that uh, are infected that don't even know they're infected or they're very mildly infected, they show very mild symptoms. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people that are extremely sick, critically ill, and have passed away. So people you know, have to realize that there's a spectrum of, Ill of illness. And I think like with the flu, you really wanna be careful if you're a high risk person. So those would be young people, older people, or anyone with a chronic medical illness. So those are the people, certainly we target those people with flu shots, but you know, the coronavirus too, those people should take extra precautions and, and sort of think twice about um, you know, making sure they're washing their hands and all those things that we talked about. So, so I think um, you know, the bottom line is preparation is key, and, and I think as, as a school district, I think we'll We'll definitely be working closely with the health departments, and any changes, you know, we'll, we'll communicate those as quickly as possible. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, two more parts to this. I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Castaldo, Mr. Schleicher, and Mr. Martone. This has really been all of us coming together, everyone kind of taking their parts, areas of responsibility, their contacts throughout the county and in the state. Um, and working together to really make sure we have all these pan plans in place. So I want to thank the team for um, their part in that. I would like to share the video. I sent it in um, the uh, Connect Ed that went out, but it's so worth watching. So it's five minutes of our time, and I think it's really well done in terms of informing us about the virus. Where does it want to go? And let's protect ourselves. I'm Dr. Peter Lynch. 
I'm a family physician in Toronto, Canada. The coronavirus is a family of viruses that can cause as mild things as just a common cold, all the way up to SARS or MERS. These are these bad pneumonias that we're talking about. And basically what these viruses are, they look like a tennis ball with all these spikes sticking out of it. And depending on the type of spike, it allows that virus to attach to certain places. So some viruses, they have the spike that attaches to your nose. So basically, you just get a common cold. But the SARS virus, and this new virus that we're talking about, has the spike that allows it to attach to the cells in your lung. And when it attaches there, it puts in information to make photocopies of itself. So it uses our equipment to make more viruses. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. Coronavirus. Most of the coronaviruses live in animals. In this particular case, it was from Wuhan. There was a fish market where they were selling live animals. And the thought is, is that the virus was in a live animal, then it crossed into a human. But then what we found was that people were getting sick in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of family members that were looking after them, which now meant that the virus could pass from a human to another human. Just like all viruses, it needs to reach a target, which is your lung, and it has to get there with your help. It has no feet and no wings, so therefore it needs us to move it there. So that's why we keep saying, don't hang around sneezy people because you're gonna breathe it in, and don't touch your face because that's how the virus is gonna get it. The masks are helpful, but they're not necessary because they're leaky. The ones that you and I buy basically have pockets here, so therefore the virus can get in. What the masks really do is they stop us from touching our face. If you're sick, we tend to mask you, so therefore you're not spewing out the viruses to other people sitting around you. The true people that have the real masks are the N95. Those are sealed. These are for the doctors that may be caring uh, for the patients. So in the beginning, the coronavirus will cause kind of like flu-like symptoms or a cold, so people just get the stuffy nose, that kind of thing. But you'll understand that as soon as that virus starts manufacturing in your lung cells, they're producing all these copies of the virus, all of a sudden now you kill the lung cells. So now you can't exchange oxygen, and that's why one of the early symptoms is people get very short of breath, and they tend to have a difficult time breathing, and that's why they end up in hospital. So currently, unfortunately, we don't have a direct treatment for the coronavirus, so we don't have a medication that can kill it off. And so it's really supportive. So in other words, the patient can't breathe, we give them oxygen, help them to breathe. They can't drink, so therefore we give them fluids to support them. Their kidneys begin to shut down, we help them with all those things. So it's a very supportive process. This is a new virus that we've never seen before. So our immune system, our army, are having a hard time figuring out what to do. So usually what we have to do is we make something called antibodies. So these are things that can grab onto the spikes that we see on the virus and it will get rid of the virus for you, and that will actually bring you back to good health. So therefore, the elderly may have a worse outcome. And of course, the young children, so the babies, their immune system is not so good either, so they may not make those antibodies as well. So just remember, your hands may be with virus. The virus cannot hurt you because it can't get through the skin. But the moment I do this, now I've brought the virus right to where it wants to go. So let's remember not to touch our hands to our face. So let's say you think that you might have been on a plane or you might have bumped into somebody that has it. What should you do? So the first thing is to contact a healthcare worker to tell them that potentially you have it. If you're feeling symptoms and you're going to go into a facility, call ahead. Okay? So whether you're calling the paramedics or whether you're calling the hospital or your doctor, just mention that you were on a flight. If you don't have any symptoms, then what we do is a little bit of a self-quarantine. In other words, we can just keep you away from other people, and so you don't go into parties, don't go with your friends, don't go into public transportation. So we can contain it very easily by making sure that you do a self-confinement, so to speak, uh, for the, let's say, seven to 14 days is the longest incubation time. So after that, if you're feeling well, then you don't have anything to worry about. So we get the facts right, and we don't have to be overly worried, but we do the right things so that we don't get the virus ourselves and that we don't pass it on to others. And if we look after each other in this way, this virus will have nowhere to go. It needs us to move it, it needs us to make copies for it, and if we don't help it, then the virus will stop. So we have the power to do that right now. kind of where
Doctors are on the same page. <laughs> Yes, I finally graduated from third grade, and um, I was there with uh, Kenny uh, Wojciechowski and the uh, P PBL, which is uh, project-based learning. It was a great demonstration by third graders. Uh, raise your hand if you know what hydroponics is. Okay, so I'm the only one in the room who doesn't, but I do now. And these third graders did a, there were five groups of, um, third grade in this one, one class, and they presented, and they drew, and they did these great present presentations at the age of eight. So when they get to the middle school, they're gonna be doing even greater things, and when they get to the high, high school, they're gonna be incredible. Um, and maybe they'll be in robotics, which would be great. Uh, and, and the whole idea of hydroponics, it's, it's super, so, uh, I was, I was lucky to, to be there and to witness it, and uh, we have some great things in this district. I'm preaching to the choir, or making a note to the choir, but uh, really, it was, it was just uh, great. So Kenny is doing a great, great job there, and I know he doesn't just work in the elementary schools, he goes to the high school, he goes to the middle, middle school as well. Um, so just wanna give him a shout out. Thanks. All right. Great. I, uh, I just want to say congratulations to the uh, hockey team for their section championship and uh, good luck against Bethlehem up at Union College and uh, congratulations for the quarterfinal victory for the Southern basketball team and uh, good luck against Mount Vernon. We'd like to see you go to the finals this year. Okay. All right. Uh, public participation. This is public participation on any district-related matter. Um, if you would like to speak, please approach the podium. Every speaker will have up to three minutes to talk. Total time for the session will be 30 minutes. Please refrain from mentioning any uh, district personnel or students. Please announce yourself as well. Thank you. Certainly. Good evening. Um, my name is Jessica Lang, uh, Jessica Pullman. I'm a parent of a first grader at R.P. Connor Elementary and an incoming kindergartner uh, that was intending to go to R.P. Connor. Uh, however, we were notified a couple weeks ago that she is not going to be going to Connor. She's going to be going to Viola. The board made a decision last spring to rebalance the district. They didn't think about the families that would be directly involved and directly impacted in that decision. They didn't think about the families that they were going to be ripping apart, particularly kids that would be going to separate schools. The stressing of the, of the parents that were going to be having to accommodate different start times because we're going to an early elementary and a late elementary. Multiple pickups, multiple family events, multiple school events at two different elementary schools. They didn't think about the incoming kindergartners that had to navigate entering kindergarten alone without the support of their siblings. The district's solution to concerned parents who did not want to rip their families apart 
was to rip the established older student from their current emotional, social, and academic circles that they've already established in their current school. The district is essentially telling those students, my child, my first grader, the collateral damage of this rebalancing disc plan, that they're just a number. They don't count. They're telling my child, who just excitedly made her debut in Bye Bye, Baby this, uh, Bye Bye Birdie this past weekend, who wants to apply for a speaking role in third grade, that she doesn't matter. They're telling her that Viola is going to be the cash of a school for her if we decide that we don't want to split our family up. Viola can't accommodate with an older student orientation all the things that she would be missing if I pulled her from R.P. Connor. Viola does not have a school play. Viola doesn't have the Girl Scout troop that's supporting her throughout these last two years. No student orientation that's provided at Viola will be help, helping her overcome those things that are helping her flourish academically and emotionally. To add even more insult to injury, the district inappropriately canvassed my four-year-old. R.P. Connor sent a letter in January to my house. My house is apparently two houses from the district line. My four-year-old saw this letter. My four-year-old is excited to go to R.P. Connor, joining her sister that she's been waiting to do for the last two years. She thinks, because of the letter that was sent to her in January, that she's going to be going. Now I have to tell her that she's not going there. How does the district, who's on year two of a rebalancing, not know their own zoning attendance lines? How do they make such an egregious error and emotionally toy with a four-year-old? There's enough emotional transition as we're entering this transitional period for kindergarten to add this additional stress of having to now realize she's going to, an emotion, uh, to a different school. And the district's response to all this was, oops, administrative oversight. My four-year-old knows everything about Connor. She knows where the gym is, the, the cafeteria. She knows that Miss Benadi, the principal, is going to buy her lunch and that she's going to ride the bus during student orientation in May. She knows that the words to the songs that the kindergartners are going to sing during their kindergartner show, Alphabet Soup. She knows all of these things because of the experience she's had with her, her older sister. And now she no longer has that opportunity because of the administrative oversight. How is the administration guaranteeing that they're going to be able to excel, uh, educate for her excellence when they can't even figure out which elementary school she's supposed to be going to? I've attempted to email my concerns following the final decision from the district. I emailed last Monday. I've yet to receive a reply. It's been over a week. The lack of communication and the lack of administrative organization, particularly around this rebalancing act, is very concerning. It's alarming. Mr. President and, and the board, I ask you to consider to right the wrongs that you have done to my family, the emotional distress that you have caused my family, and grandfather my family into attendance at R.P. Connor. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other, any other speakers that would wish to address the board? Okay. We'll close this portion of the meeting. The closing comments. Back to Superintendent. I have a few. I wanted to also thank ONR for their very generous grant to the robotics team. It was very exciting on Monday to go over and um, spend time with the ONR folks interacting with our robotics team. I would also like to uh, congratulate um, our, our presenters. So we had over 20 administrators and teachers attend um, the Yale EI National, International? The Inaugural National Implementation Conference. Of which the, ended at four today. Like of, the, anyway. of the Ruler Program, which is the um, program we've been implementing. We started last year with the staff and this year with the students. This is the Social Emotional Learning Program. You may have heard about the charters. For sure you've heard about the mood meters. That all comes from this program. Um, in addition to the 20 plus um, attendees we had at the event, 
uh, Dr. Castaldo, uh, Mrs. Benani, Mrs. O'Keefe, and Mrs. Jess also presented on a panel um, at the conference, which is very exciting. So I want to thank everyone for their participation and the four presenters for their leadership. I'd also like to congratulate our Chief Information Officer, Ms. Lillian Ranchera, who is no longer Mrs. Lillian Ranchera, she is now Dr. Lillian Ranchera. She defended her dissertation today at Fordham University, and uh, we are very proud of her. She's worked very hard on it, and I do want to share it. I want to share the title of her dissertation because it is well connected to a number of topics we've discussed tonight. So the title, I, don't, I want to make sure I get it right. The title is, A Study of Factors Which Impact Latina Participation in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So congratulations, Dr. Ranchera. Thanks, so congratulations. That's it, all right. Uh, at this time, would like to have a motion to adjourn and return to executive session. We will not be returning um, after we're done. So this is a motion. Right. This is a motion to adjourn during the meeting. Is there a first? Dr. Nick Pond. Second. Second. Bureau. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those against, any abstentions? Thank you all for coming.